Good morning uh, in America. Good afternoon in Europe and good evening in Asia. Uh, thanks very much for being so loyal to the encounters and uh, for staying with us today. This is our sixth encounters. I uh, would like to welcome all our students, especially these students coming from Bocconi University under the direction of Professor Laurent Manderieu. Uh, we know they are always there and Bocconi is the first university, but it will not be the last joining the encounters in such a massive way. As you know well, the soul of the, of the encounters means a think tank. Uh, this is not uh, uh, a webinar as usual where you will get information, information and information. This is a think tank where three professors or professionals coming from all over the world today uh, coming from the United States. Uh, well, Irene Calboli, good, good morning, Irene is in Singapore, in fact. Uh, Alexander von Mullendal uh, from Berlin, in Xuqin Lin in China. Uh, they will discuss uh, on the future of our trademark system in a cognitive era. At this very moment where the fourth industrial revolution and the post-COVID environment uh, is certainly producing all sorts of exponential changes. Uh, I would like to uh, introduce uh, a friend who will be the moderator today. This friend is Alberto Casado. I don't know since when, I, I don't remember actually since when I know Alberto Casado. I think it's ages. I, I guess we know each other, Alberto, since we were kids. Uh, but you are my friend since around 40 years ago. Alberto has been everything in the world of intellectual property, vice president of the uh, Office for the Harmonization of the Internal Market, today EWIPO, vice president of the European Patent Office, uh, director of the Spanish uh, Patent and Trademark Office. But above all, Alberto has been always a frustrated scholar. Uh, Alberto would have been a great scholar. He has written much more than many of us have written, I have to say. I don't know where he found the time. And uh, he is a doctor and uh, uh, now he is, uh, mm, does not occupy any of these uh, posts he have occupied during, uh, during his whole professional year. He will devote more and more time to scholar and uh, this is one of the reasons why he is our moderator today. So welcome Alberto, uh, it's a great pleasure for us to have you amongst the Encounters uh, College. I would like to give the floor to uh, my friend Javier Fernandez Laschetti, representing FIDE for just uh, half a minute or a minute, and then Alberto will take the floor and we will continue, we will start the uh, encounter. Thank you very much. Thank Javier, you very you much. Have the floor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Manuel. Uh, as usual, very shortly, uh, just to welcome you on behalf of uh, FIDE and uh, to say that we are very, very happy to have you here and to have this, uh, this uh, panelist and, uh, and moderator. Uh, there, are, there are some old friends, some new friends, well, but we all are friends. Uh, and remember, this is not a webinar, this is a community and uh, you will find useful information in our website and uh, you will find uh, other, other sources of information and we hope to have you here, not in this one, not in the former ones, but in the future because you belong to this community. So thank you very much again and I give the floor to uh, Manolo once again uh, to start with. <laughs> Alberto, ready to start? You oh, have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, all of you. First, thank you for inviting me. It's a real pleasure. As you said, uh, somehow I am a frustrated scholar. Having said that, I have been professor at the university for at least 25 years. This is okay. And secondly, let me, let me to, uh, uh, thank the organizers for putting uh, on the flyer a seven years old picture of mine. 
I look much younger I, I, in reality. I, I love it. I, I, I really was very happy when the, I, I, I saw uh, the flyer. Thank you. Thank you indeed. And, and now let me uh, 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 talk about a little bit about what we are going to do uh, um, and uh, to introduce our speakers. Uh, just a general reflection. As you know, uh, markets are demanding new products or services, better and um, maybe different kind of IPRs and quick uh, solutions uh, to some of the issues raised by the new industrial revolution and the current health uh, pandemic. Uh, the scenario created by uh, this double uh, factor, COVID and uh, industrial revolution, requires from uh, uh, our point of view a global and flexible approach. This is the reason we have organized this encounter. And the idea is to have an open debate. We don't need to, uh, 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 we don't want to exhaust uh, all the issues. We only want to raise some open questions. And this is the main reason why today we are going to analyze three re relevant topics on the trademark fields. The first is the effects of the COVID and the post-COVID uh, pandemic uh, on the application and protection of trademarks and maybe on the trademark professionals. The second will be the non-traditional marks role importance and um, how new technologies come allow and uh, reinforce uh, uh, their uh, protection. The third will be the concept of bad faith registration and uh, its connection, it could be one uh, uh, idea, with the impact of the COVID uh, uh, epidemic and um, the lack of intention of use. Uh, I must underline that the attendance to the today global encounter are a very lucky group of people. Why? Because uh, uh, to present these three items, we have three global IP authorities. We have uh, 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 Irene uh, Calvoli, uh, 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 sorry, uh, uh, Irene, I prefer to use your uh, uh, Italian pronunciation, uh, uh, from the uh, Texas AMM University. Then we have uh, uh, Professor uh, Alexander von Mullendal, former uh, Vice President uh, of EUIPO, well known trademark expert, and the most important thing a very old uh, friend of mine. And finally, we have Professor Xu King Lin, Deputy Dean and a Professor uh, of Law of the CMM uh, University. Three fantastic uh, people from three different uh, uh, continents. You can see their uh, CVs uh, uh, in our flyer. They are uh, too long, and then I prefer not <laughs> to avoid to read it. Therefore, uh, I, I, I am going to give the floor to our expert. But before doing that, just one uh, last remark uh, addressed to the audience. You can ask for questions. I repeat, you should ask for a question. Don't be shy. Do it. This is a part, a very important part of our encounter, a very important part of this exercise. Ask for questions and we will try to answer uh, uh, these questions during the section or later in writing. Now, if you allow me, I would like to give the floor to Professor uh, Calboli that she is going to talk about COVID uh, and uh, uh, and uh, 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 application of protection uh, of trademarks. You have the floor. 
Many thanks uh, to the organizer of this beautiful encounter. Muchísimas gracias. It's an honor to be here. It's a pleasure to be with uh, such distinguished moderators, with great friends, distinguished speakers, and of course, Professor von Mullendahl, who I can call, um, I was still a student when I was at the Max Planck Institute, and Professor von Mullendahl, of course, was very active working on uh, uh, the trademark issues back then. Um, I was asked to um, comment about trademark application related to um, the pandemic. And the reason why is because I'm conducting um, a, an empirical study of the current application that have been filed with the USPTO. Um, as of now, we have data until um, consolidated until the end of September, and uh, um, in a month we will have uh, data until the end of um, October, and then we will map the whole year by January. And uh, what is really interesting, and I think it's interesting to refer to the group, um, it will be interesting to see all the comparative analysis with the, U the, with the UIPO, but in the US at least, as of now, um, we have been looking at the, uh, anything, any application with the word COVID, with the word coronavirus, with the word social distancing, with the word shelter in place, quarantine, and six feet apart. Uh, and uh, we have over six, almost 700 applications that have been filed. No mark has been granted at this point. Um, and uh, what has been interesting, we have divi been dividing this uh, application by type. Um, and we have divided by type of business, medical business, unrelated existing business, merchandising or slogan, and also slurs, because in the United States now we can register um, trademarks that are offensive terms. And of course, there have been a few applications with uh, some uh, um, slurs related to the war COVID and coronavirus in particular. And our data found that we have uh, around 200 applications related to medical businesses and over 300 applications related just to merchandising and slogan, uh, then around 200 applications related to other businesses, for example, COVID for um, sources or uh, legal services, um, and uh, around 10 applications for slurs. This is an unprecedented number of applications for um, something, um, you know, as as a pandemic. We also made um, some controlled. Uh, we look at other big events in the United States, such as war in Iraq, 9-11, um, uh, and other pandemics, such as the Ebola pandemic, such as uh, um, the H1N1, and none of them triggered the same amount of results. Um, the results were within the numbers of less than 100. Um, what is also very interesting is that the vast majority of these applications are filed by either individuals or um, LLCs, so small companies. And those for medical businesses on the other side, for the vast majority, are filed by corporations. Of course, these are filed mostly based on an intent to use basis rather than on a use basis. And uh, the, you know, there is a large number that is uh, filed in the class, including medical services and medical products, but then of course the apparels and some uh, um, unrelated goods, but vast or a lot, um, you know, class 25 gets a lot of, this, of these applications. So what can we do uh, with that? And, you know, I want to keep that very short. Will this application be registered? Well, it's going to be difficult to register trademark with the word COVID because uh, for medical businesses, perhaps, and we were looking for application by application about disclaimers. Uh, of course, the word COVID and coronavirus will be very descriptive, if not generic, of course, of the disease. Um, and so no business will be able, particularly in the medical field, to use it. Um, and might be the logo, the configuration, 
um, the specific setting of the, 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 the picture or the, the, the sentence around the, um, the, the word that can be registered. So it's the overall, not just the wording. Um, for unrelated business will be interesting because uh, the concept of secondary meaning, our distinctiveness and arbitrary use of an existing term could perhaps be used. Certainly for merchandising, I would say that the doctrine of failure to function as a trademark, this is not a mark, um, it's mostly a slogan, it's a decoration, it's something else and a mark will kick in and we will see a lot of this application just being rejected and very much the same for slurs. But it's really interesting and that brings to what I call a bigger pandemic is explosion of applications of some catchy phrases and the question is, why? Why are small businesses and individuals just applying for trademarks that we are quite sure will be rejected? They are spending fees such as almost $300. Uh, this costs the USPTO searches because every trademark application is actually opened by an examiner and there is a notice action sent mostly to get higher, you know, more information because many of these will not be, it's not the final office action, so it's a non-final office, office action um, before rejection. And so there is a cost both for the system and for the filer. So this is also a bit of a mystery for us. Um, I don't have an answer why this is happening, uh, but it certainly is happening and many individuals are filing this application thinking that perhaps this mark could be useful to them for something. And then there are ethical reason why those might not be registered, uh, the fact that they're not distinctive, the fact that this should be used by other uh, and, and competitors and anybody who needs them, the fact that we should not take advantage of such a terrible disease uh, and terrible situation for the world. It will be interesting to see what the other uh, panelists think about, because I know that in the EU and in China, they've been filing as well, uh, probably not to the same massive amount as in the US where uh, we have now you know, over 700 application, um, 500 plus just for the uh, for terminology, including the word COVID. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Irene. Uh, 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 Alex, do you have anything to mention on that? Well, yes, thank you, Alberto. Thank you very much, uh, friends around the world, Irene, and of course, Alberto, for your kind introduction. It's good to see you in such youthful appearance, uh, contrary to the picture. You still look just as young as you are and where. The, we are looking at, uh, not yet at a post-COVID, we are looking at a world where COVID is with us. The economic downturn, the Great Depression affects individuals and companies, societies and well-being of the world we know. We shut down traditional communications, new IT communications like this one we're able to see and hear around the world, loss of personal proximity. I, for example, haven't seen my children and grandchildren since early spring. So the flood of COVID related applications, which is an interesting individual item, as explained by Irene, is an interesting item, but it is only one of the many things which this crisis has brought us. Has the epidemic had an effect on trademark filings in general, in addition to these new types of applications which present new issues of examination? I've looked at the EU IPO figures and with the exception of March and April this year, the trademark applications in 2020 have exceeded the 2019 applications in each month. For example, in the months of September, there were more than 15,000 applications this year, and that is almost 3,000 more than last year. So apparently, whatever we talk about, the crisis has not affected total numbers, at least at EU IPO. Also, if you look at the origin of applications, you would have thought maybe the crisis has had an effect. In 2020, the, the first filing country is now China, whereas in previous years it was usually Germany, United States, followed by other European countries. Now the sequence in 2020 is China, Germany, 
United States, Italy, United Kingdom, Spain, France, Netherlands, Poland and Switzerland. So maybe the recovery in China, which has been much faster and more effective than it has been elsewhere in the world, has led to this increase of filings from China. Then just to mention, our working methods have of course changed. Volatility of infections, we are now home officing, uh, like we are now presenting this each from our home. And of course, the IP offices also are working in a different fashion now. And don't forget, we are just at the beginning of the crisis. It's just beginning. And we have very, very difficult times ahead of us. That's what I wanted to say, Alberto. Thank you very much. Uh, many thanks, uh, uh, Alex. Uh, I don't know if uh, uh, Professor Lim would like to uh, uh, say anything on that. Uh, yeah. Um, I would like to introduce uh, one very interesting case. We fly back to uh, Irene's point. Uh, in China, uh, this year actually um, there are over, I think, quite a few hundred trademarks application related to COVID-19 or similar, you know, um, term, uh, but were. All, almost all were rejected. And one case uh, involved uh, the name of the modular hospital called the um, Thunder Mountain uh, Hospital, another called the Fire God Mountain, uh, Fire God Mountain Hospital. And someone tried to register the two, the name of the two hospital as um, trademark and was uh, rejected on, based on um, unhealthy um, effect. So basically is uh, Article 10A of the Chinese trademark law. So it seems it's kind of, maybe it's kind of um, quite global phenomenon. Uh, some people try to take advantage of the you know, the name of the disease or some medicine or some any terminology because, uh, you know, for quite a few months, especially in China in, in February, March, so people were very nervous. So then uh, the most, the hot, the topic I think everybody talk about or pay attention to is the news, uh, new case about uh, uh, the virus. So, but fortunately, uh, all the most, almost now uh, is under control and business, I think, are gradually back to normal because I live uh, near a um, tourist, you know, attraction uh, site. So then uh, now I can see every day, you know, people coming back uh, very crowded again. So yeah, it's um, yeah. Thank thank for the organizer for the very interesting topic, and thank for Irene for a very um, great introduction about this point. Okay, that that's uh, be all from me about this topic. Thank you. Uh, many thanks, uh, uh, Irene. Any comments from your side? Um. Yes, one, one thing also to circle back when we think about COVID and trademarks, um, we have seen, and this is no longer about application, I, um, in, uh, back in, uh, in, um, in May, I gave a, a lecture for um, Bocconi and for uh, Professor Manderieu, and was about trademarks and COVID with specific attention to the U, to what famous brands have done uh, during the COVID time. So whether it was back in the spring, um, the fashion houses fast transforming their supply chain into producing PPEs and gowns, uh, donating to medicals, Louis Vuitton uh, uh, start to producing um, disinfectant and hand sanitizer. Many of the perfume companies started to, and so how the goodwill they had accumulated and so their brand power really continued to carry on into, of course, it's not technically trademark per se, trademark law, but how the social responsibility, the corporate social responsibility wanted to continue to build into that 
goodwill that these brands have uh, created and wanted to carry on for public uses. Um, and I think we have seen a considerable amount of, uh, of, um, of that. Uh, during the first wave of the pandemic, in, and uh, and uh, and then of course, um, online businesses and and other businesses and support and solidarity, um, I think that also was very interesting um, development. And then of course uh, the adaptation of products and production. Um, now the mask fashion, uh, the 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 PPE fashion, the the shields fashion. So registration for unusual products compared to what are the traditional products, just because market opportunities have also come along uh, uh, during this pandemic, and so some of the pe pe people choices uh, have been forced to buy product, and of course that also become a market opportunity for brands and for trademarks. So I think uh, it's interesting. Okay. Uh, uh, very good. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much for the, your uh, uh, how conclusions uh, that you have uh, uh, already raised uh, uh, in the second part of your intervention and now if uh, uh, you allow me I would like to give the floor to uh, Alexander von Mühlendahl that he is to talk about the non-traditional uh, uh, trademarks. Okay thanks Alberto again Fido thank you very much for having us. <clears throat> I'll try in the three, three four five minutes that I have to give you an impression of how I see the issue of uh, non-traditional trademarks. We know that since t time immemorial the makers of goods and traders uh, in goods have identified their goods by marks, not only horses and cows with brands. Traditionally, these marks are words or devices, uh, but they're always visible signs. The first category of what we call non-traditional trademarks remained in the two or three dimensional visible world. We talk of shapes of products and of their packaging. We talk of colors and color combinations. That's where we stood when the TRIPS agreement permitted member states to limit registrable signs to those that are visible. It's of course rather banal and has nothing to do, by the way, with our present COVID dominated world that we are capable of identifying things or persons, not only visually, but also by sound, taste, smell or touch, not to speak of the sixth sense at all. So that's where the new issue is relating to so-called non-traditional trademarks arise. Signs or marks which are not visible, but clearly still capable of identifying and distinguishing goods or services according to their commercial origin, thus to function as trademarks. Also, novel categories of visually perceptible signs arise, such as holograms or moving signs, those that are not stationary in time and even among our traditional two or three dimensional visible signs, we have new categories such as position marks and pattern marks. So that's the universe of what we call today non-traditional marks. A modern and rational legal system providing for the protection of trademarks through use and registration would not seem to have any problems in recognizing and protecting all signs, including non-traditional signs, including those which are not visible on the basis of use. Protection is then based on the use of the allegedly infringing sign on the market by identical or similar signs. However, when looking at protection through registration, the first question of issue or issue that must be answered is whether and if so, how such non-traditional marks, especially those which are not visible, can be registered. It seems to be accepted almost everywhere, perhaps with the exception of the USA, where registration is closely linked to use, that in order to be registrable, a sign must be capable of being identified precisely and accurately, so that the examining authority and the public know what is claimed as subject matter. Think of patent law, where disclosure must reveal something which actually functions as claimed. European Union trademark law, with which I'm most familiar, has taken the step in 2015 for its unitary EU trademark and for the laws of all of its 27 member states of no longer insisting on graphic representation, but on clear and precise identification of the subject matter. 
Current technology allows such clear and precise identification, of course, easily for two or three dimensional signs, including shapes and colors, and also for pattern and position marks. Sound marks, if not reproduced by standard notation, may be perceived from sound recordings deposited at the IP office and rendered audible via the internet. This is where we are currently with our new technologies. Moving or motion marks may require a motion picture video with or without sound, and that may apply to holograms as well. Experience at EUIPO with these marks shows that the issues of identification are solvable and do not present a serious obstacle to the registration of visible or audible non-traditional marks. Quantities, the focus on non-traditional marks is of course entirely out of proportion to the actual numbers, but the interest seems highly plausible because of the many novel issues. At EUIPO at the end of September 2020, there were 197 applications for position marks, 50 for multimedia marks, 11 holograms, and compare this with a total of 10,000 for three-dimensional marks. What is so far not possible is to identify accurately and precisely signs consisting of smells, tastes, or touch, unless and until we have an accepted manner of making these, per these perceptions reproducible rather than merely describe them under our standards, our meaning EU law, such signs must be left out of protection on the basis of registration. Issues arise for non-traditional marks, of course, are not limited to formalities. We have absolute grounds examination. There's very little case law so far on sound marks, even though they have been around for some time. I feel that there is a tendency of excluding simple sounds as being non-distinctive. Perhaps someone in the audience can share their experience. As regards motion or multimedia marks, we are just beginning. We were able to overcome an objection ourselves as a firm with a motion mark, which is now registered. Then there are the absolute exclusions, the goods themselves, the technical functionality, the value conferring shapes. How are these going to be applied to these types of marks? Then if you look at conflicts, we have questions of similarity between marks of the same category, sound against sound. We have conflicts to determine when the conflict is between marks of different categories. Here again, there is much we still have to learn in order to understand how these non-traditional marks are actually integratable into our systems. I mentioned clearance. How do you clear novel trademarks when we have no proper standards and no uh, search criteria and no uh, identification of individual features yet. How are we going to do this? How do we search moving images or holograms? Finally, at the international level, I want to arise the issue what, when leaving our own jurisdiction. I begin with the absence of acceptance of all forms of non-traditional marks in all the various trademark systems. The minimum standards of TRIPS do not provide an answer. How about priority claims based on such non-traditional marks, even, in, even if they are recognized in the jurisdiction where priority is claimed? How do you prove priority? What do you do with the documents? And I, how about Madrid? Can we get these marks registered through Madrid when that system is still basically based in the 19th century, in the 20th century? I leave you with these final thoughts. And once again, I'm grateful for giving me the opportunity to participate in this encounter. Thank you very much, Alberto. I give it back to you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Alex. Um, I ask myself if uh, uh, Irene or uh, uh, Professor Liu would like to uh, add anything more on this particular matter. Uh, I mean, perhaps um, uh, Professor Lin can start. Um, I have a lot to say on this topic, but <laughs> you are expert. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Professor Liu. Okay, so uh, firstly, thanks uh, for the for organizer and for the moderator for the introduction and put all the great work together. And I feel such a great honor to work with um, this um, distinguished team. Um, I am invited to talk about something about um, the bad face 
under Chinese trademark law. Um, the background is uh, last year in 2019, Chinese trademark law was um, revised again. It's actually the first revision. And the essential um, amendment to trademark law is to add the in Article 4 to state that the trademark application not for the purpose of uh, use in bad faith, such applications should be rejected. And this actually create quite a substantial, you know, um, change to the practice in Chinese tra trademark, you know, perfection. Uh, as all, you know, the audience here may have known, uh, China is the first to fire system and it has been the country that accept most trademark uh, application for, I don't remember how many years, at least 15 years. So now in total in China, there are about uh, 26 million trademark, you know, in, in force or valid. So then uh, that means because under the first to fire system for quite a long time, uh, in China is uh, is legal for any business or even individual to apply for as many as trademark as he wants, and it's fine. And some people even uh, use this channel, you know, as a business model. They apply for a trademark, get granted, and then sell the trademark. So that you know created many um, program and criticism. So last year uh, the law was revised. So basically I think to curb this kind of practice. So however then what does it mean by bad faith registration then? So actually in legislation there is no clear definition. And in practice, you know, drawn from uh, the judicial practice and also the examination practice in the CIPO, the China State Intellectual Property Office. So basically, um, we categorize the bad faith registration into four groups. So one, I uh, basically say is uh, uh, free right, the famous or high um, reputation marks or domain name or the name of individual of others in bad faith. Second group is to um, register, try to register the, the generic name or generic terminology in a particular perfection in big quantity. So basically um, the judge or the disciple will categorize this group under the um, ruling, under the ground of uh, unfairly occupy the public resources. And the third group is to uh, register trademark based on other people's prior right. For example, uh, the famous name of uh, a book or video game as such. So then um, the ground for this to be um, held as bad faith is this kind of practice may generate misleading among relevant public about the resource of the products or services. And the fourth group 
is um, uh, refers to kind of practice um, that repeatedly or um, consecutively register the same mark to avoid the uh, man use cancellation of three years rule. So then uh, this list is not um, is not exhaustive. So that means in China, what does it mean by bad face? So the list can go on. And obviously, uh, after 2019 uh, revision, the concept of bad face has been extended to cover practice such as um, we call the hoarding trademark. That means uh, register the large amount of trademark for the purpose of selling it for profit instead of using it in, uh, in business. And also, you know, practice such as uh, register the uh, famous um, famous public place as a trademark, so um, can be held as a practice of bad face. Um, so here, you know, I give you um, a very um, high profile case. It's a Chinese company. So actually, it happened a few years ago. Uh, register almost uh, 500, over 500 trademark based on the trademark of Victoria's Secret, such as uh, Simply Gorgeous, Brilliant Love, Sea Love, and such, and many others. And so then uh, this company even uh, put the trademark for sale on the website. So the price can be uh, between 2,000, um, 25,000 to uh, 70,000 RMB. So um, they sell trademark for profit. So then this kind of practice. Um, so in China, it has been going on for quite a few years and sometimes it's horrendous. So in my view, the 2019 revision is a good approach for the right direction because um, um, in a business environment like China, you know now, especially the e-commerce uh, is, is, is really booming, uh, especially after the COVID-19. So even so, you know, so now most people basically they do shopping at home instead of, you know, going out. So then uh, the trademark is becoming more and more important here. So understandably. So then uh, the trademark, the new uh, revision, I, I, I think is a good way to stop uh, the free riding practice. Um, secondly, I would like to uh, sum up is to give you a uh, two data. So um, one data is um, in 2018 alone, the China's uh, trademark office um, rejected trademark application based on bad faith. So the case amounts to um, over 100,000. And 2019, uh, first season, so if the, the number is about 40,000. So then uh, I, you know, I don't have uh, more up to date data yet. But uh, I, as I can see, I think this year uh, we will see, you know, I guess, you know, very likely we'll see bigger number of rejection based on bad faith. However, you know, China still uh, is a first to file jurisdiction. So, but they are, you know, how now today, how court or SIPO 
to determine bad faith. So it's a big question. And some scholars, a very famous scholars, Professor Li Minda, he suggests, you know, the CIPO should ask the trademark applicants to submit evidence to prove that his mark has been used or is about to use in a specific area. And the trademark application can only be fired for the categories that the business already shown in the company's business license. So, um, but I doubt, you know, in, uh, you know, uh, foreseeable uh, future, the Chinese court will go as far as it is. <coughs> but uh, there's something that need, need to be done. And I think the CIPO, both the CIPO and Chinese court, uh, you know, look into the, you know, approach to determine what a, will amount to bad faith. So, and I think that in the first round, I will give, you know, as much as I can. Um, I will stop here and welcome any questions from the audience. Thank you. <coughs> Alberto. To go, uh -huh. here I am. I should be okay. Good, perfect. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. As always, I, uh, first I would like to give the floor to the other two uh, uh, speakers if they have something to to comment or to add to this uh, uh, fantastic uh, uh, presentation. I Irene. Um, thank you again. Um, so coming back. Um, and if that's okay, I would comment both on the non-traditional trademarks part and the bad faith. Um, I will start with the bad faith, and it's really interesting to see what um, is going on in China. I was, uh, we were looking for uh, uh, Christian Louboutin uh, registration for um, lipstick and other cosmetics just last week. And uh, uh, it was remarkable, not only the application pending, but the actual registration that are some iteration of La Bouton, but actually are not related to Christian La Bouton business and a clear bad faith registration. Um, so what could be interesting to see uh, in a jurisdiction that now is really um, growing in is uh, uh, desire to be uh, respectful in uh, in intellectual property ecosystem is not just what can be done for future application and of course preventing bad faith registration, but how bad faith can be used to cancel existing bad faith trademarks. I think the Jordan saga, uh, the Michael Jordan saga, it was a very interesting one in that mm -hmm. sense, but. But bad faith is not, you know, a problem just in China. It's a problem in, in many jurisdictions. Um, um, it's, you know, there is there is specific rules in Europe. In the U.S., uh, we have uh, um, um, a, a system based on application can be filed on intent to use, but the actual use is needed. A statement of use has to be filed for a um, framework to be actually registered even though this threshold is very low. The, the actual use, it's a very low um, um, use in commerce, to be honest. But still, you need to have an extra paperwork, and there is a oath, uh, and there is a signature. And so the, the representative of, um, or those who sign the mark, the trademark attorney can really, um, um, you know, there can be a, a challenge of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, and, you know, misrepresentation if they sign something that is clearly in bad faith. So this is this is certainly an important point, uh, as there is so much copying and ripping off uh, of between quotation, of course, of famous trademarks um, across the world, and this this idea of well-known marks and then bad faith and how. Uh, we can we can use that, but in the U.S. we have, for example, the uh, the, the the use the registration of uh, Havana Club and Cohiba that are non uh, that you know that they are non related to the Cuban trademarks because we have an embargo law, and uh, 
and there's been litigation over these marks. There been even be a WTO case uh, with uh, a, a, a condemnation uh, for the United States to recognize the Cuban trademark, and we have not done it. Um, and uh, it's also a problem. It's not a problem of bad faith, uh, perhaps in the more traditional way, but it's clearly is an illegitimate registration based on a prior use uh, and a prior registration of a well-known mark, a way that cannot be used in the United States because those products cannot be used in the United States market because of an embargo law. And so I think that, again, the bad faith is really not a Chinese problem, it's a worldwide problem and then we can zoom in in jurisdictions. Uh, perhaps Professor from Mullendal wants to, to, to chip in and we can talk about the non-traditional trademarks perhaps in the next round. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Uh, well, I think the, the, we have heard enough about uh, bad faith and I think I only can subscribe to what uh, Irina just said, it's a worldwide problem. We have to face it everywhere there may be a particularly uh, egregious violations in a country like China with their 8 million or how many ever trademark applications they have. China is still the main source of counterfeit goods. Don't forget this, they, most of the counterfeit goods come from East Asia. So it is, and there the issue is, is in a way similar. How, what are the means of s stopping these kind of abuses of the trademark system which are done by counterfeiting or by squatters or pirates or bad faith applicants uh, putting up a market for trademarks that they actually don't own. I think China must be recommended for attacking the problem by legislative means. So, but I don't really want to add to that. So, Irene, if you want to say anything on non-traditional marks, I'm happy to listen. Very good. Uh, uh, um, I don't know uh, if uh, uh, Irene wants to answer. If not, if not the case, uh, because we don't have too much time, uh, uh, I, I should uh, prepare some uh, conclusions. Uh, it's complicated uh, uh, because you have already raised a lot of uh, uh, open questions. Let me just to mention a couple the uh, uh, dramatic uh, uh, increase of uh, trademark uh, applications and probably a potential relationship between the uh, uh, the COVID pandemic uh, and the changes in the business model and why not in the bad faith uh, practice. Therefore, probably uh, we should connect uh, 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 all these three uh, elements. In relation to non-traditional uh, uh, mark, many uh, question marks have been uh, 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 raised that is evident that uh, are uh, 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 growing uh, step by step and it's also evident that will be a, a dramatic impact uh, 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 of the new uh, uh, technologies uh, developed uh, under the the current industrial uh, revolution and the increase of this kind of non-traditional uh, marks. But I would like to raise a, 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 a question not to be answered today. But as you know, in some countries like in Mexico, apparently they have they are accepting uh, smell uh, marks in uh, with a written description. Uh, something that we have already rejected in Europe in the in the EUIPO, but uh, uh, in some uh, uh, countries they are reopening this uh, uh, question. And finally, uh, 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 open question from my side. Uh, 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 the potential uh, uh, relationship between bad faith, lack of use, and uh, the so-called uh, weaknesses of uh, the global trademark system. This is something that having already uh, 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 raised during our uh, uh, exchange of views, but it's something that probably we should think about uh, in future. Uh, I would like to continue uh, uh, talking about that, but uh, we don't have too much time, uh, unfortunately, and uh, I would like uh, uh, to uh, give the floor to our dear uh, uh, friend uh, Laurent uh, Manderier, uh, because he should uh, 
help me with some uh, closing remarks and probably to give us additional information on the next encounters. Uh, Laura, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alberto, for your moderation. Thank you to all speakers, to all extremely uh, senior and distinguished speakers for your presentations. We are really, really happy to have uh, feedbacks from, um, from Europe, Asia, America in this uh, global uh, encounter. Uh, we have still questions in the chat. And concerning the questions that are in the chat, as per the Global Encounters tradition, uh, if replies are not provided during the encounter, you will receive as registered participants in priority our uh, recording of this session, but also replies that our panelists will make to your individual questions raised in the chat. So this is why it's so important and it is that you write in the chat and this is also a way to connect between ourselves. So my dear uh, and esteemed speakers and participants, in the program, Professor DeSantis and myself have conceived for this uh, event dedicated to trademarks, or this first event dedicated to trademarks, we intended to make a very quick review on the current situation in the COVID context. You remember that the uh, global digital encounters look at the future of intellectual property in the post-COVID era. COVID strikes us dramatically, uh, our private lives, our professional lives, there are dramatic consequences. The, such a, a crisis, which is not a war, but simply a health crisis, simply and essentially, which is so tough, a health crisis, also brings fantastic new opportunities, such as digitalization, wiring together from all over the planets, uh, from all over the planet. We have in this conference attendees from all over the world, and this is also a way to create a better post-COVID world. So our big objective in these encounters is to think in the post-COVID environment, what will happen afterwards. Based on what we know from today and what we are studying, including today, we are constructing together a think tank, a community. So that's why it's so important for us that you stay with us, tuned in in our next events in the by also having access to the report on the encounter, to the recording of the encounter of the current one, and also to the replies to the chat. I can disclose the topic of our next encounter, which will be dedicated to trade secrets, to trade secrets mm. and uh, to how trade secrets play a key role between uh, for business environment. We will have at our next encounter a European approach on the trade secrets connected to, of course, the directive adopted in the European Union and uh, its ups and downs, its big advantages and its limitations as well. We will uh, compare it with the uh, context in the US and also uh, very importantly with the uh, fastest growing part of the world that is Asia and China. This yeah. is why we are so happy that uh, our colleague from China could be logged in and could be participating today. And also, of course, uh, Professor Calboli being in Singapore, uh, having a foot in Asia, a foot in America. <laughs> so in this very, very case, we will uh, continue our intercontinental review of issues. And in this sense, trade secrets sounds to us as the key topic. Our next encounter is due normally on the 1st of December with exceptional speakers as well in a very lively and dynamic context. So please stay with us, stay in our community for this next event. I thank uh, on behalf of the Transatlantic Intellectual Property Academy, 
co-organizer with the FIDE Foundation of this event. And uh, I really thank uh, FIDE, the uh, FIDE Foundation of Spain, for uh, pulling efforts, for constructing together this project we have developed. Now we are at Encounter 6, and we have planned at least 15 encounters in the uh, next uh, uh, year as well. So I would really wish to thank FIDE for their uh, support, for their for being not only supporting, but being constructing together with us this activity. I would, uh, my thanks are addressed as well to uh, my colleague and friend, Professor De Santes, co-director of this uh, activity with me, and also to the numerous sponsors who support, promote the visibility of these global encounters, make them evolving, because we are we do not intend to be to intend to be a static group. Uh, I would also wish to express my gratitude to all those who are in the uh, background supporting us, those who help us writing the reports, those we who help us making uh, the uh, uh, IT sustainable for participants that uh, have reached the number of 1,000 at some of the encounters. So I really want to express all my gratitude. I wouldn't close this uh, conference today without a thought for those who are in pain and suffering due to the epidemics. And my warm regards are addressed to them and to uh, their families uh, for this very uh, delicate moment health-wise. Thanks to our speakers, thanks to all of you, and see you very soon in early December, so that even if our uh, end of the year is a bit spoiled by the situation, we can enjoy wholeheartedly a new scenario of growth, thinking that IP is a tool for growth, for recovery from what we are suffering, and a tool, a generous tool for development. Thanks to all. I declare on behalf of uh, our uh, um, group the end of this session. Thank you for staying so numerous, connected until the very, very end of the session. And bye bye to all of you all over the world. On our behalf. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Laurent. Thank you to all. <laughs>